Good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome and thanks for coming. Uh, it's strange to do this and not to be able to hear anybody, but I'm assuming there are people out there. If anyone has a question at any point, just please just uh, write your question down and I will see it. You can even say hi and who you are so I know that people are there. And if I know you, just let me know who you are so uh, I have some connection to this uh, experience instead of staring into a computer screen and uh, talking. So uh, I'll begin just by introducing myself, and uh, then we are going to uh, have a brief uh, PowerPoint, which is going to show some of the work I've been doing in Africa and just giving you a visual input of some of that. And, uh, and the main gist of what we're going to do tonight is to talk about uh, the new book I have written called uh, Comparative Materia Medica. But, uh, just before that, a very brief introduction. My name is Richard Pitt. I'm a homeopath originally from the UK. I've been practicing for 30 odd years, and uh, I came to the United States in 1988, and have been living here for the majority of that time uh, until 2008. Uh, I ran the Pacific Academy of Homeopathy for 12 years, and I uh, was on the board of the Council for Homeopathic Certification since its inception, and for 17 years, uh, I was on the board, including being president and all of that, and on a number of other organizations. And uh, I have been editor of the California Homeopath for eight years, and it's now an online journal. You go to californiahomeopath.com, and uh, I've written a number of books on homeopathy. This is my, my third book. The first was Approving a Study of Tobacco. The second was The Natural Medicine Guide for Travel and Home, and now this material medical book. I taught uh, for Barbara Seidneck at the Homeopathic School International for, for many years, since uh, roughly 97 to 2006, and uh, I'll be moving from Colorado to Boulder uh, and teaching there a lot with her, so we have a long, a long relationship. And uh, since uh, 2008, I left the United States and um, ostensibly to take one or two years off, and that's now trans a seven-year, uh, I call it a sabbatical. Uh, and uh, I spent a lot of this time working in Africa, uh, doing volunteer work. I lived in Ghana for nine months, working with the Ghana Homeopathy Project. I worked in uh, Malawi on and off for two years, working with Harry Van Der Zee, the editor of Lynx magazine. And since 2012, I've been working in Kenya at the Kenya School for Medicine, which is where I am now mainly based. And I am now uh, the educational director of that school. And uh, we'll begin by talking a little bit about this project. Uh, uh, about eight years ago, a Dutch woman called Marie Margrave moved to Kenya, near Mombasa, in the hills south of Mombasa, with the inspiration to start a school. And then it developed into a homeopathy school. She did a primary school to begin with. She was trained as a homeopath and had the vision to start a homeopathy school. And seven years later, that's exactly what's happened. Uh, she had land. Uh, and then raised a considerable amount of money over years, uh, mainly from the Dutch government and NGOs and individuals she knew, and has created this institution where we now have 100 full-time boarding students, most of whom are doing a four-year diploma course in homeopathic medicine. And outside South Africa, it's the only homeopathic educational program uh, of, any, of any real size and merit, if you want. And she has been running the school for this amount of years, and we also do a nutrition program and a community health program. Uh, and we are developing our institution now uh, to move even more into uh, adjoining medical subjects as well as homeopathy. Uh, last year, uh, we wrote a proposal to the European Union to advocate for improving healthcare in this particular part of Kenya. Uh, historically, Kenya had these elections in 2006, which led to an outbreak of tribal violence because of the disputed election. As they are created a new constitution, leading to devolution of many powers, including healthcare. And one of the results of that is that the Minister of Health in our county, where we live, uh, has been a great supporter of alternative medicine, uh, including homeopathy. And through that partnership between us and the Ministry of Health, we were able to get this five-year project sponsored through the European Union to advocate for the integration of complementary and alternative medicine within the healthcare system. And so my job now is to actually train physicians and nurses and clinical officers into homeopathy. 
and to start integrated medical clinics in the hospitals uh, within our county and there are six district hospitals and our goal is to start uh, an integrated clinic in each of those and to run 36 mobile clinics attached to these in the area. The result ideally being the full integration of homeopathy in the county leading to policy change in Nairobi within the medical and uh, the political institutions so that homeopathy becomes fully recognized and regulated as a medical specialty in Kenya and uh, our county in a way is the uh, model for doing that and we have a five-year mandate to do that and we are now eight months into the project and have made considerable progress and I will be back there in, in less than two weeks to take the next phase and I'll be traveling to local hospitals teaching uh, people there about homeopathy and eventually to a professional level so that they will run the clinics themselves. So it's quite a formidable project, uh, even though we have funding through the European Union, we have to raise significant amounts of money each year uh, for that project and part of my goal here is to publicize the project to some extent and also to uh, ideally advocate for people to help support us in our work. Uh, as I say, we have 100 students right now, we have uh, 30 staff, uh, we have nine teachers and uh, we have quite a project going and Marie is a very dedicated woman and has given her life to this particular work and uh, and as I say in the last three years I've been supporting her in this vision and so far so good we're making amazing progress and so I'm just going to show you ideally a few uh, pictures so far and then we will then move on to the book uh, just to give you a little preamble that's the cover of my new book it's a, a 500 page textbook it doubles up as a doorstop and a pillow come if you if you need another uh, require those things and uh, it literally only came out in the last three weeks and I will come back to that in a minute and that uh, is the website of the book and if you need to, uh, to check that out as we talk about the book it has a lot of different background information and essays which you can look at later about the book and what the vision is and what the ideas are and uh, so this is it homeopathy in developing setting for Kenya is the charity the school is run by a charity based in Kenya called for Kenya uh, and there's run and that is funded by a Dutch charity and that's the main organization that actually raises the money and that's in Holland but if you go to forkenya.org and you will see the school website and that's our property uh, you can see the buildings there are, are made of normal natural stone and we have what they call Mukuti roof which is a local thatched roof we're in the process of repairing those because they are seven years old and they are leaking so we're doing quite a lot of renovation work now on our property and uh, we are going to keep the central building which is a central me meeting building uh, as is but the rest of the buildings are going to have a, a tin roof and the building on your left has just been restructured and we now have a, a new library pharmacy two, two uh, classrooms and a clinic room in that building on the left. The one on the right is a uh, four-room office block and we have accommodation behind that as well. We have another campus just over a road behind all that and that's where all the students stay, where our restaurant is and we also have a conference hall. So the school began in 2008 and that was some of our students there. As you can see there are all school graduates who are about 18, 19, 20 years old and uh, some are older. Mainly Marie focused on uh, poor people from poorer backgrounds, mainly women at the beginning, uh, and even people who, who were called orphans, even though in Africa an orphan means something different than it does here. You can just be missing one parent, for example. But anyway, we try to focus on the education of people who otherwise would not get any other education. And that's graduation, as you can see, it's quite formal, a bit different from graduating from our homeopathy schools. And that was a congress we had in 2012. Uh, this is what led me to the country. I was in Malawi at the time and uh, Marie, in conjunction with Jeremy Sher, who was based in Tanzania, organized this first uh, Pan-African Homeopathy Congress. 60 homeopath doctors from 16 countries came. People drove all the way from Swaziland and uh, came from all over the place. And so that actually uh, sort of introduced me to the project. And after that, that led me to go back in 2013, 2014 and now 2015. And it was a fantastic conference and we did a lot of work and that's one of our lecture halls and uh, one of the teachers at that conference. And this is just what the trust is. You can see it's spelled with a 
the Dutch uh, spelling of Kenya. It's an autonomous regional institution of distinction, primarily serving Kenya and the East African community at large through the education and advancement of homeopathy and primary health. Uh, some of our students there. And they're all studying under the big Makuti roof in the meeting place there. And we have a computer lab which mixed as our library. We've now moved the library out and that whole room now is full of computers. And uh, we have some of the radar and uh, Mac repertory programs and textbooks and everything there. A squashed photograph <laughs> of Marie and some other graduates. I think that was the first year of graduation. Some of those people now are teachers at our school. So uh, I work directly with local teachers who teach most of the subjects. And that's Marie at the graduation. And uh, the person to Marie's left is a, a great Welsh doctor called Noel Thomas, supported our school very much. And he has helped us work with the Faculty of Homeopathy in the UK. The faculty is the largest, uh, well, it is the only main organization that trains physicians in England in homeopathic medicine. And the, we, are, we do their accreditation examination, the first level of accreditation as part of our education. We also teach the students how to swim, how to drive. Uh, we do many things. Uh, we, they do specific computer courses and uh, first aid so that they get a rounded education. So when they leave, they're ready to do many different things. And that's one of our clinics. We run currently eight mobile clinics around the area. We sometimes have to travel two, three hours to reach the clinic. And sometimes it gets stuck in the mud if it's rained and we, we go to quite remote areas and we're going to be doing much more of that when we get back. Where we are is the Kwale County is in the southern part of uh, Kenya. If you look at Mombasa on the map, which is the largest port in East Africa, and you go sort of south of there toward the border of Tanzania, that's our county, and that's, that's where we are. And it's quite a remote area with a lot of Ma Maasai people right on the border of Tanzania, and it's dry, arid, and very poor, which is one of the issues there with healthcare problems because they have one of the lowest uh, levels of healthcare efficiency in the country. So some of the statistics are not very good. Aha, introducing yoga. We had a great guy called Eric from uh, New York at one point, and uh, he was a yoga teacher. And so we do yoga with the uh, students sometimes. And that's a conference in our lecture hall that we have there. So these are not our students there. So they were at one of the seminars we had. We hold seminars. We've had United Nations organizations. Now. And that's our mission and vision to improve community health in Africa and Kenya by using complementary alternative medicines, which is the turtle, you know, the CAM uh, uh, denomination that they understand in Kenya. And uh, that's basically it. That's the work we are doing there. And uh, uh, there's some of the photographs we're doing there. And as I say, I'll be back there in two weeks. And uh, we'll be carrying on the next phase of our operation. And uh, we will be reviewed at the end of one year, which is next February. And uh, the EU will be uh, looking to see how well we're doing and what needs to be done and any changes that have to happen. So let me uh, move on from there. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I should be able to get them uh, on the uh, screen here uh, as we go down. Let me just check something here. Okay, so great. Let me give you some a little background. Uh, six years ago when I left uh, America, I decided to write two books, which I did concurrently. The first is The Natural Medicine Guide for Travel and Home, which is uh, right there. Where is it? Oh, here we go. So this was a travel book. I felt like there was a need for a new travel manual on homeopathy that explored all the challenges of travel. I called it the Natural Medicine Guide because I thought homeopathy, you know, had been under a lot of attacks, and I wanted it to be a broader vision, and I include herbal medicines as well as homeopathic remedies. And I really wanted to have something that would actually be useful for people when they travel. And having spent years of my life traveling, I've lived in India for years, and uh, as well as Africa now, Australia, New Zealand, uh, South America, Brazil, and uh, other places. And I thought there was a real need for another really good travel book. I say really good. I hope I hope it is. So uh, that book I wrote six years ago, and I've just uh, two years, 
two years ago it's finished and I've just rewritten the book again and it goes into a lot of tropical diseases which uh, I had personal experience of in myself in Africa having had malaria twice actually and I can talk a little bit about that but during that time I also was writing my comparative material medical book I see my screen's frozen okay so the idea behind the comparative material medical book is that as we've explored new remedies in the last 20, 30 years, it's expanded the amount of knowledge and information of homeopathy, which has been a great uh, advance in our knowledge as we look at remedies that we did not know. And as we know, nature is a very infinite place, as it were, and the world has infinite varieties of potential remedies. But the question in homeopathy is, do we need them more? Most, many people seem to function well with 100 remedies, 150, 50 remedies. How many do we need? How useful are they? And how often are we going to be using these medicines? Some have been proven. Some have been just created out of an abstract concept. Some have been found out about through other sources. Some were meditation provings, etc., etc. And within homeopathy, there are different philosophical positions. Some people believe that it's not a homeopathic remedy unless it's proven. It cannot be a homeopathic remedy unless the remedy has been actually proven. Other people say, well, if it works according to homeopathic protocol then, uh, and homeopathic principles, which we already know, then through clinical data and clinical information, it's validated, it's verified through that. And that's a philosophical position different homeopaths can take. I'm in the middle. I actually think we should do proving for our own scientific credibility. It's the foundation of our knowledge. And even that being said, there are good and bad provings. Sometimes provings go too far and they make too many assumptions about the essence or totality or understanding of a remedy. Whereas most traditional provings from Hahnemann on were really based on just the fundamental symptoms. Most were physical symptoms. And Hahnemann's early provings were fairly physical in, in, in the potencies used and in the effects the remedies had. We've become slightly more esoteric and psychological in our analysis of provings. But uh, a proving in and of itself does not necessarily validate a remedy. It's only validated, in my uh, opinion, in clinical experience and verified in, 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 in an empirical uh, way. That's the only way in which ultimately that knowledge of that remedy can be consolidated and, and, and deemed to be true. So I always felt there were three levels of knowledge. There were provings, there was clinical information, and then there was knowledge of the substance itself, which is going to study the nature of the substance. This has been critiqued in terms of the concept of doctrine of signatures and uh, the simplistic view that people have had that the doctrine of signatures, for example, the shape of a leaf determine the organ it's used for or whatever, is not homeopathy. And Hahnemann himself had critiqued this concept. But I think that if that study is taken much more deeply and gone into much further by studying the biochemical analysis as well as the larger context of the substance in which it where it exists, how it behaves, whether it's an animal, vegetable, or mineral. That has to be giving us valid information. It has to reflect something authentic or real about the essence or individuality of a substance. And every substance has its own individual reality. It behaves according to its own criteria, its own DNA, its own basic template. And everything is unique, as every human being is unique. Even if we have 50 billion people on the planet, everyone would be unique. There's infinite capacity within the DNA model of, of the human organism to create a unique person at every point. In a way, it's an extension of the concept of the universe being infinite. So that being said, where do our remedies start and where do they end? Do we want to take remedies from every satellite, every, every planet, every, you know, how far do we go? Hahnemann and the main provers at the beginning, the main homeopaths, focused on substances that were already known. They were known to us through our experience of them. They were known to us through our study of nature, and that's why they were chosen. And that's why they are still the fundamental building blocks of our material medica, the sulfur, the calcareous, the potassiums, the magnesiums, the natriums. And all those substances are elements used by the body. They're part of our physiology. They actually are necessary for biological function, for life itself. So in, as we go to the deeper metals of mercury and plumbum, their normal biological necessity is not necessarily there. But many solutions are actually needed in our body. Many plants we have an intimate connection to. Many trees we understand well and we've used them 
as part of our human experience. Therefore, we have a relationship to them. Therefore, those substances that I think we are, are known to us and that we use and we have a relationship with are potentially the more important ones for us to find as medicines and are going to be the more useful ones in general for a wider range of conditions. Even though we're all different, as human beings, we all share many qualities, many values, many physical functions. And as such, that's why certain remedies like sulfur or phytis and like a polyam or a cocaine are possibly more useful in that context. That being said, the prejudices of our material medica and the misconceptions that have existed in our knowledge have been passed on without being questioned. And some of the modern work being done is to try and challenge some of that. And my book was quite influenced by some of the work by Franz von Rulen, and I, I quote a lot from a couple of his books, especially the one on fungi and the, the one on Monera on the bacteria, because uh, he explores in a very interesting way those substances. And so I learned a lot from it quite considerably in the book. I was also quite influenced by the work of Peter Fraser, a British homeopath who's written uh, books on different, different um, realms of nature insects and spiders, uh, and on and on and on. Transformation from the realm, he's, they're called. And uh, I recommend reading his work. He also wrote a book called The AIDS Miasm. And also, he's done some interesting work and he's a good academic and, uh, and researcher. So that has been some of the foundational work for my book. So what I try to look at is that as we learn material medica, we start from the beginning. We learn the main polycrest. That's our building block, our foundation. We need to have a profound and deep knowledge of those remedies and how to compare those remedies. And that's why I said even with a hundred medicines, you can do good work. You don't need to know so many obscure remedies to work competently and get a good statistical result in your practice. And in some ways, I think a good solid knowledge of polycrests and their relationship can lead you most of the way in your practice. You don't have to get overwhelmed with the burden of so much more knowledge. But you never want to exclude new information. You don't want to say, oh, I'm not going to give any remedy that hasn't been used since 1900. I'm never giving any remedy that Kent never used, etc., etc. Everything is in a state of evolution, a state of flux. This is nature. This is reality. You can't change that. And the more conservative trends within homeopathy are, in a way, a bit like people who say the American Constitution is infallible, you can't rewrite it, you can't do anything, or everything in the Bible is infallible, it's, you know, it represents a level of perfection that can't be improved on, and to me that makes no sense. Everything is done and everything moves and everything evolves and changes whether we like it or not, and that includes our knowledge base of homeopathic material medica. So I wanted to grapple with this and find a way that I could explore new remedies but not exclude the old. So I wanted to integrate it as, as we would in our own learning, moving from the known, moving to the unknown and coming back and not getting caught in any one place. One of the things I found in homeopathy is that people need, because it's amorphous and it seems somewhat esoteric in its methodology, we try to find a system, a way a map that's going to make it more methodical, more concrete in that way. But any map is, an, is a dense one-dimensional. It can be useful. But in a way, as a living organism, which homeopathy is, and as a human being, which, are, which is you know, a living organism, it's never quite that simple. And no one model, no one system, no one way of taking the of analyzing is going to be comprehensive in every case. You've got to adapt. You've got to go with the flow. It's the only way to do it. So my book, in a way, partly reflects that. It's not structured in this linear way. It's actually kind of an organic process of merging and then coming out and looking at different ways. So as opposed to New York with the grid system, my book's more like a map of London where you have to understand the, the cul-de-sacs and the nuances and how this road goes there and this road goes there a bit like a London taxi driver, you know, who before they actually can drive a taxi, they have to spend years learning the whole map of London, 15 million of a match, and it's called the knowledge. So a taxi driver has to learn the knowledge before they are allowed on the road, even in the day of days of Uber and all of that. Uh, do you want to take the risk of getting a taxi driver in London who has no idea where they're going? 
So, in a way, our Mature America is a bit like that. It is a knowledge, and it's, in a way, the heart of our study. Homeopathy in our Mature America is like the language. It's the language of homeopathy, and I often equate homeopathy in the study of it. It's like learning a language. We interpret the language of our patient into the language of homeopathy and the language of our books. And that way, you know, our books, when we study Mature America, is literally like learning a new language. And it's an essential part of our study uh, to be a homeopath. We're learning about the human organism, the human function, human consciousness through the language of our Mature America. And it's extremely sophisticated. And at the same time, it is challenging. And it's challenging to find your way through it. Obviously, experience is the final arbiter of, of knowledge, and the more you've given a remedy, the more you've seen it work, the more you actually understand it inside yourself. It becomes part of you organically on, on, on a visceral level, but it's really an unconscious phenomena. But the fact is that, that knowledge that's within you, that is the beginning of, a, of an intuitive process in homeopathy. It comes from experience. It's not something you pull from the sky. But then you have to balance that intuition with an, uh, and a concrete, rational way of understanding a case and how to interpret it and then how to find the correct remedy. And so what I tried to do in the book, and in the beginning I, I, brought out, I bring out some concepts and I'm going to look at the book as we go along, is a 50-page introduction in which I explore certain concepts. One of the first ones I look at, I said that in, the, in a remedy picture, there is a line of progression between health and death. And within that line, you will find all the different aspects of a remedy. Any one person, though, is only in one part of that line. They're at the beginning, the middle, or toward the end. And every remedy has its realm of influence manifested in the symptoms. And so you will see a healthy a person who needs caustican, for example, in a more healthy state, being optimistic, idealistic, you know, out there, quite passionate, but in the, in, the, in, in the unhealthy stage, they are sinister, exhausted, depleted, and then all the physical symptoms with the neurological symptoms and, and, the, and, the, and the contraction of the bones and the deformity and all of that. If you read Kent's lectures in Material Medical on Corsicum, you read that stage of the remedy. But it's in the modern works of people, especially like Fethukas 30 years ago, who brought out a more complete, comprehensive image of a remedy. So in the book, there are 36 chapters. Each chapter is a major remedy. Most are polycrests, though I include aconite, I include arnica, I've got apis, arsenicum, I have calcarea carbonica, agaricus, etc., etc. You can see this on the website. Uh, it lists in, in the contents of the remedies. And I analyze the remedy in each chapter according to three stages of progression. The first stage is I call the intrinsic stage. This fits the concept of constitution. And constitution, if you read some of the ideas of constitution, especially by French writers like Vanier, constitution is that which does not change. It looks at the basic genotype of a person, the body type, how they function, their behavior, their personality. A lot of the images we have of our remedy include that information. They include that, that which does not change. But that is still what we use to help us find the remedy. You cannot change the essential nature of a person. You can help modify maybe the exaggerations or the imbalances, but your nature is basically your nature. So that information needs to be understood, especially in the polypress remedies. The second stage of the remedy, the intrinsic stage, by the way, I associate with the soric miasm. The second stage is what I call the compensated stage. It's an exaggeration of that first stage. It's an exaggeration of what is normal. It's like in sulfur, a person who's a bit garrulous and a bit uh, over-intellectual and abstract becomes more so or more haughty or more critical. It becomes more than their normal stage. It's where people go when stress hits or when your body breaks down a bit. That is mostly the information we give the remedy on. We give it on the compensated stage, but we include information from the intrinsic stage. And that could include food you eat. We know sulfur creates spicy foods, sweets. You know, Does that change on a remedy? Not that much, unless it's so extreme that they're putting red hot chili peppers in the cornflakes. You know? I mean, that might change. 
Normally, though, the food doesn't change, but it can be helpful to find a remedy if we're prescribing at that level. And by no means are all prescriptions on a constitutional basis. I mean, in my opinion, it's one of the mistakes we make in homeopathy, that people are always looking for the constitutional totality, essence, core delusion, and we've become over psychologized in our prescribing. And we miss keynotes. We miss simply what's in front of us. We miss the importance of etiology in prescribing, which is this very important part of homeopathy, which we often miss. But we often prescribe on symptoms mixed from the compensated and the intrinsic state. The compensated stage I associate with the psychotic mind. It's an exaggerated state, and psychosis relates to exaggeration. The third stage of a remedy picture is the decompensation, which relates to the syphilitic miasm. That is the broken down stage of a remedy, and that's what a lot of the old material medica was made up of. Nitric acid picture in Kent's, Kent's uh, pictures, or curious is often reflected in the decompensated stage or the syphilitic stage. So it's the pathological end point of a remedy. Where does the nut vomica go in its pathological end point? It goes to breakdown in the nervous system. It goes to extreme depletion. It goes to ulcers. It goes to neurological diseases, to spasms. It goes to, to total depletion, exhaustion, chronic fatigue, etc., etc., etc. But in many cases, a nuclear will not be in that state. You have to identify a remedy within only a sliver of information that may exist within any one person, because any one person will only produce a little proportion of the picture that you need to see. And that's the skill in homeopathy, the extraction. A few keynotes, a few points of essence, a few pieces of information, and you have enough to put the jigsaw piece together. The metaphor I often use when prescribing is that a patient comes in and they put jigsaw pieces on the table. You have to slowly, through converse, conversation with them, is to put the pieces together. You have to make sense of it. But you don't even see the image until you've got most of the pieces together. And you think, oh, look at that image. Oh, that might be that remedy. But you still haven't put all the pieces together yet. And as we know with some remedies, they look alike. And so it takes time to dig in deep enough so you can really make that distinction between one remedy and another. And the mistakes we often make is the assumption that even when we only put half the jigsaw together, we have enough of the image to prescribe on. However, a really good prescriber can identify the right remedy without that much information. That's, that's the point. They can put the pieces together and you recognize that from your own experience. But ideally, the more pieces you put together, the more comprehensive the picture, the more the totality of that picture becomes clear. And when you put the jigsaw together, the whole thing is, in a way, is an image of that person's life. It's a story. It's a story of their life. And in a jigsaw puzzle, like a painting, you can have images in the front, which might be one part of the story, images in the back, that might be their, another part of their story. And then within that, you can put it. But then we come to another point. Is there just one correct remedy for a person? Or is there only one remedy? And one of the assumptions that has been quite broadly put around is that there is only one remedy a person needs for their whole life. If only you can find that. It's our inadequacy in prescribing that makes us meander from one area to the other, from one remedy to the other meandering to cure instead of the straight line, which would happen if only we could find that right remedy. In my opinion, this is a fundamental mistake and misconception about homeopathy. Even though we're always trying to find the one most perfect similimum, the perfect similar, even if we do find it, it doesn't mean it's the only remedy that someone needs. It really doesn't mean that. And mistake if at the beginning of, the, of a case we're trying to define where the remedy belongs. Is it mineral, animal, or vegetable? I believe that actually we need remedies. Everyone needs a remedy from the mineral realm at some point probably and or a remedy from the animal or vegetable realm. If you oversimplify that in the beginning, then it leads you astray very quickly. The complexity of a human being and human experience means that in many cases more than one remedy is needed in the whole 
process of cure in order to bring someone to optimal health. You cannot find it with one remedy only, unless the person is already relatively healthy and all the picture is very clear and it happens by luck or whatever to cover the whole thing. So I spend a lot of time in the book describing also about nosodes, about how to prescribe nosodes because nosodes have a particular function in our prescribing. They relate to a particular genetic disposition, an inherited disposition and they tie very much into the development of miasmatic theory, which Hahnemann obviously was the founder of. He began that principle, that idea, that philosophical paradigm, but it's been taken a lot further. Remember that Hahnemann did not ever use metarinum or cephalinum. They were created after his life. Swan was one of the creators of those remedies in the 1890s or 1880s. I don't know exactly when. So. Hahnemann, the way he saw it, as you read in chronic disease, he saw it, he said, was seven-eighths of all chronic disease, and his list of psoriatic conditions goes on and on and on. Psychosis and syphilis was really seen as an obstacle to cure. If people had actually had those diseases in their own life, not as an inherited disposition, he focused at, in Sora being an inherited disposition, a thousand-headed monster, which in fact was not really Hahnemann, but was Kent talking about that. So, but the concept of inherited disposition was really about the origins of disease regarding Sora. Why? Because Hahnemann was giving medicines that were not curing fully, and he then philosophized, theorized that there had to be an underlying deeper causation that he related to the chronic miasm, and he was correct in this assumption. We've seen this proven, proven time again. But, as I mentioned, he didn't give metarine or cephalinum. He didn't know those remedies. So his understanding of the influence of psychosis and syphilis as chronic miasms as significant as Sora, he did not extrapolate on and was only developed further by different homeopaths over the 19th and then the 20th century. And then from those three, we then developed the other mechanisms of tuberculosis and cancer the five grand miasms. There has been more modern work and other miasms introduced, whether it's the malaria, the typhoid miasm, uh, the leprosy miasm, etc., etc., and I think those need serious uh, understanding in that way, and I do believe that you can look at miasms in that way. Personally, I focus mainly on the five chronic miasms for their inherited disposition although I think we need to pay attention to other miasms, for example, the smallpox and the plague, uh, because these were such significant diseases in human history, and by that means we have to be carrying the memory collectively within our DNA of those diseases in us. And so I still think there needs to be more research into the leprosy miasm and the smallpox miasm as well as understanding it, because they were so significant in our development uh, throughout history. And also with syphilis, you know, syphilis, as we know, in the venereal syphilis came from the New World in 1485. However, there's been research into non-venereal forms of syphilis going back thousands of years, so there's a more complex level of syphilitic influence that Hahnemann probably attributed to Sora. So this is a very interesting area, and I think the use of nosodes in prescribing is one of the most important areas of homeopathy. And in the book, I spent a lot of time in laying out the ideas of when a nosode is needed and how to understand the comparisons between nosodes and other remedies and how to justify the use of nosodes. So this is one other area that I explore a lot in the book. So what else do I do? I talk about ideas of when another remedy is needed, the idea of the second prescription. So what does that mean? You know, that means that when one remedy is worked but not completed a cure, you move to a second remedy. And you have to understand the comparison of remedies and the relationship is how to do this. Ideally, a new picture suddenly emerges leading you to the next remedy, but it's not always that easy. So I go into that subject about how to give that remedy. I talk about external and internal factors and the concept of layers and the idea that in the environment we live in today, we are dealing with a lot of bombardment, whether it's vaccines, electromagnetic waves, whatever. How is that impacting our health? And how is the relationship between the external impact and the internal relationship to it, your susceptibility 
those two balancing out in order to find the right remedy. So it's very important, as we know, to understand the external circumstances and environment of someone's life, the food they eat, etc., as well as what we do in homeopathy, which is to look at susceptibility, the underlying susceptibility which allows someone to get sick by their exposure to different circumstances. But I always say that the stronger the external influence, the less significant your individual susceptibility is. If we're all hit on the head by a 16-pound hammer, we all get a, a bruise on our head, or we all get concussion or a cracked skull. So the stronger the external influence, the less necessary the individualization is. The more important etiology becomes in your prescribing. And I talk a lot about etiology and the levels of etiology in homeopathy which also includes uh, myosins or acquired diseases in this lifetime. I've never been well since I had the flu vaccine. I've never been well since I had uh, this four, five years ago. I've never been well since I was born because of the birth process. These things have to be looked at and really given attention to. So that is one thing that I talk about a lot in the book. I also talk about the term constitution, what it means, and I quote from Vanier's book, Leon Vanier wrote a book called Typology in Homeopathy and looking at the basic physiotype of personalities. And he defined three main types, the carbonic, the fluoric, and the phosphoric types and related that to the myosins. And that's one of the areas that is interesting. Predominantly in French style homeopathy, but also overlaps into our idea of a constitution. And even if you read Alan's keynotes, for example, you will read at the beginning, suited for thin, rigid, fibred individuals with weak muscles. You know, you could be talking about fluoric acid or cochlear phosphoric or whatever. So this information has been integrated into our concept of homeopathy. And therefore, it's important to look at. And I like that book, Typology and Homeopathy. So, as I said, 36 chapters. Uh, every chapter is well known, except for the last chapter, which I entitled Zinjiba. Z I N G I B E R. What is Zinjiba? It's ginger. And uh, I include it as a slightly humorous kind of way of doing it. It's, you know, it's a ubiquitous substance, but we don't really know it as a homeopathic remedy. Why not? Maybe it should be equally as used as nuts vomica. In fact, it's one of the remedies to compare with nuts vomica. So uh, I use that chapter as a heading to include all the remedies that don't quite fit in elsewhere. They don't quite belong as comparisons in the other chapters. And I start talking about the bowel nozodes uh, for a while. Uh, I then go into and I compare the bowel nozodes with other remedies. I then have a subheading called the plague, the pox, the leprosy, and AIDS, these four diseases that have plagued the human. Through the ages, there's often been one disease that has dominated uh, the zeitgeist of human consciousness, if you want. Uh, we're now in the AIDS miasm in that way, or the cancer miasm, and then, of course, you had leprosy, and you've got smallpox, and then you had the plague. So I look at those remedies derived from, as nosodes from those diseases and compare and contrast them to other remedies. So we do that, and then I go into the remedies made from childhood diseases, the whooping cough, measles, mumps, rubella, and chickenpox. They should never be forgotten, you know? We, these diseases exist, and now they're being suppressed through vaccines. So uh, I look at the remedies made from those, and also from Hib, diphtheria, polio, hepatitis B, etc., etc. Et so the remedies that are made even from these vaccines that need to be used sometimes. I talk about other bacterial nosodes like uh, Colobacillin, and Streptococcin, and the Salmonella, Streptomycin, Botulin, and Brucella. Sometimes these nosodes are needed in prescribing. If there's been a family history of this disease or in the person's life, one has to consider them. I then go into uh, different remedies made from sarcodes, you know, made from human tissue. And I talk about those, and you include placenta, you can include adrenaline, the pineal gland, a hypothalamus, uh, on and on. These remedies have been known and used, but unless you put them in your consciousness, you often just put them to one side. So I try to weave these remedies into the book so that people can then use this book as a, a mnemonic device, as a means to explore other remedies. It's not meant to be exhaustive. It's simply a way to 
stimulate the imagination. Think, oh, maybe I should think of this remedy. Ah, this remedy hasn't worked. The lycopodium doesn't work. Maybe I need to look at this and see about this remedy. So it is a way to kind of give a key into the study of material medicine and to stimulate the imagination, to stimulate thought about other possible remedies, including more obscure remedies. I then uh, talk about other remedies that were proven more recently, like uh, DNA, RNA, dioxin, aquamarina, and some more modern remedies of ozone, positron, remedy made from the sun, Sol Britannic Luna. And so I try to include even somewhat more esoteric imponderabilia so that uh, Hanuman started it, you know, he did the uh, magnetic poles. You know, these were obscure intrapolia remedies which he used. And so I try to include some of that That's because we have to keep our mind open. We have to have that. So one of the big pieces of work I did in the book was to write indexing. Any textbook of any sort like this needs good indexing, and I spent months thinking about how the heck am I going to index this book. And in the end, I have three indexes. One is a remedy index, which lists about 400 remedies that I talk about in the end. 36 chapters, 400 remedies. And it's an alphabetical listing with uh, uh, the remedy put in caps when it's given a, a certain intensity, or where the remedy is talked about a lot, or whether it's actually a heading of a chapter. The second heading is uh, each remedy with the, with the main ideas of the remedy. And each remedy, I create subheadings. And in that subheading, I then compare with certain remedies. For example, Arsenicum album, which I have right here. In this uh, index, it starts with the remedies I compare in the intrinsic state, the remedies I compare in the compensated state, and the remedies I compare in the decompensated state of the remedy. And there are different remedies at each stage. So I use that stage process as a means to analyze different remedies who may be compared at that point. For example, caustacum may be compared to phosphorus in the more intrinsic state. In the decompensated state, it will be compared to mercurius. So it's a or stanum is a different level of pathology. Then the main themes, just as an example here of um, arsenicum album. The first theme I use is called fastidiousness, order, security. So I create the idea of fastidiousness, order, security. It's the theme of the remedy. And then I list the remedies that I compare within that one theme. Next one, anxiety, fear, restlessness, suspiciousness. Another main idea. We know that one of the main themes of our Seneca is anxiety and fear and restlessness. This is it. This is the remedy. So that has to be looked at and compared with other remedies that share those properties. Next theme, anxious, anguish, threat of disease and death, going even deeper into the fear. You know, what is the ultimate fear of in Seneca? It's the fear of dying alone, you know, with no one there, nothing, dying of not having any security. This is the ultimate fear. They even have a fear of being murdered. But the, if being murdered is not specifically that of being killed. It's the metaphor of life being unsafe and insecure. That's why they dream of it. Next theme is burning and the GI tract. One of the keynotes of our system is burning of all sorts, especially in the gastrointestinal tract. That's a theme that needs to be explored within the remedy. Next theme, cancer and ulcers. One of the main remedies we know for cancer is our Seneca mobile. One of the remedies to be given at the last stages of life, just to help people out. And again, interesting in the correlation between cancer and the end time of life and death and how arsenicum as a concept, as a remedy, as an energy, fits that stage. That's why it's needed so often. It becomes like the genus epidemicus of certain endpoints in life, because it's a reflection of the nature of the substance itself. That's why it's needed. Every remedy belongs in one stage of consciousness. And therefore, when, that, when, when a human being visits that stage of consciousness, there's the remedy. You're, you are now vibrating in that similar stage of consciousness of that remedy. That's why if we had an earthquake, I'm sitting here in Oakland, California. If we all had an earthquake now, a big one, touch wood, then we'd all probably go into the earthquake consciousness. And the remedies that would be there would be arachnids, your gelsemiums, because we'd all share the same experience. The etiology would be similar. Therefore, you would need that similar remedy. Next theme, the remedy, weakness, debilitating diseases, digestive disorders, diarrhea, and fever. 
So weakness is a major theme of arsenicum. So we need to compare with other remedies that have that weakness. Whether it's I got acetic acid, aloes, baptisia, carver veg, china, china arsenicosum, croton tigrium, cuprum, echinacea, gambogia, hydrocyanic acid, mercurius, muriatic acid, etc. Remedies that you may compare in those cases. Next theme, lungs. And we know arsenicum is one of the main remedies for pneumonia, acute pneumonia, or asthma is one of the great remedies, especially when anxiety is found with, with these symptoms. So lungs need a theme. It needs to be understood in the remedy. Next stage is skin. So we know arsenicum is a great skin remedy, chronic skin problems from psoriasis to lupus, pemphigus, uh, on and on and on. Uh, chronic eczema, arsenicum is one of the remedies to be considered with it. So each remedy is given those themes based on its main pathology, its main psychology, its main essence picture, the main ideas of the remedy. Another remedy, just as a comparison, is aura metallicum. So I'd start with the main themes, the intrinsic compensated and decompensated. And then uh, the themes are seriousness, duty, spirituality. Talk about other remedies that have those qualities, which is one of the main ideas of, of aura seriousness and duty. They have to be very much doing the right thing. Second theme, responsibility, disappointment, loss, grief, mortification. This is the polarity. The polarity is if I am not responsible for what I do, I feel guilty. I feel depressed. I feel shame. I am mortified. You know, I feel I've let everybody down. Why? Because they hold such a high standard for themselves. They're putting themselves up there on a the pedestal only to be only to fall. Even the idea of suicide by falling, by jumping, is also a metaphor of falling from a high place, a high moral position, which you can no longer uphold, leading you to fall. That has to be discussed. High standards, ambition, and haughtiness is another theme. It ties into the previous one, but particularly this idea of high standards and haughtiness is a very important theme. Industriousness, anger, and contradiction. So again, the whole thing of Orem is I have to achieve what I have to achieve. Don't get in my way. And that's where it says anger from least to contradiction. It could, could be compared with Nux Walmark in that way. But Nux Walmark has anger from least contradiction at the very beginning of its pathology, whereas with Orem, they don't. They're much more controlled in the intrinsic stage. You only see that anger coming out when they begin to go into the compensated and decompensated stage. That's the anger. And if you look at the rubric and the mind, anger, contradiction from, you see Orem is involved in all time. The reason is that is that at that point they hold high standards for themselves and other people. And if they feel contradicted, they feel they're being condemned, that those standards they set for themselves are no longer valid, that they're no longer being taken seriously. I then compare Orem to the other Orem salts, Orem acericosum, Orem muriaticum, Orem muriaticum natronatum, Orem sulfuricum. Very important distinction as it is with all the mineral remedies that have many salts of the remedy, the calides being the, probably the largest of all of those remedies, the natrums, the ferrums, etc., etc., calcareas, they all have salts of their of the main compound. So I use the major remedy, whether it's calcarea carbonica, or metallicum, uh, calcarea carbonicum, ferrum metallicum, and then I study all the salts from that. And I think it, that form of what we call synthetic prescribing of looking at the two compounds of a remedy is a very important and valid way of understanding the remedy. Even though each remedy has its own individual picture based on proofs and clinical information, understanding the compounds together also gives us added information. And all the homeopaths have done that throughout time. Next theme uh, of the remedy, despair, hopelessness, and isolation. Again, we now come into the decompensated stage of Warum. This feeling as if it's hopeless, there's no hope, there's no joy. I'm all alone in the world with my grief, my loss, my shame, my mortification, and there's nothing that anyone can do. And that's when you see the suicidal ideation and the feeling as if there's no hope. And the true syphilitic picture of the remedy is being revealed. It comes up. That's where we see it in its, in its most extreme. And looking at the syphilitic miasm, I often say that the nosode is like the sun of that miasm. The different remedies that revolve around the sun are like planets, and each one reflects one aspect of that totality. No one remedy comprehensively encompasses the complete miasm. The miasm is much bigger than any one remedy. 
but they all have their unique image, their unique picture and story. And we know mercury is the other major syphilitic remedy. It's been used conventionally and in homeopathically for syphilis forever and reflects one key aspect of the syphilitic miasm or and perhaps more than any other remedy reflects another aspect of that, of that miasm. Nitric acid also does, but nitric acid also belongs in the cancer miasm. So also identifying a remedy within one miasm only is not necessarily the correct thing to do because certain remedies, especially the polychrist remedies, will have influence of all the miasms. It's just different proportions for each remedy. Colcaric carbonica could be said to be 70% soric, 20 psychotic, 10 syphilitic. Mercury, on the other hand, is 10% soric, you know, 20, 30% psychotic, and 70% syphilitic. And therefore, most of the picture of that remedy will be in the decompensated stage. That's the nature of the, of the beast, as it were. That's the nature of the remedy. I then compare um, in this remedy, or I put gem remedies, and these are fairly new remedies. And there has been a number of works done on gem remedies and new provings. Uh, Adamas, for example, and diamond immersion. These are different variations of the diamond remedy. One is taken from the whole diamond, and one is taken from the crushed diamond. Amethyst, black opal, emerald, golden topaz, lapis lazuli, etc., etc. And so I put those remedies in the Orem chapter because some of the same themes come up for gems of high standards, purity, etc., etc., similar to what it does with Orem. So if Orem hasn't worked, perhaps we need to consider gems. I then compare Orem with remedies from the lanthanide and actinide families because these remedies are newer remedies. We've known some of the uh, actinides, uranium, nitricum, plutonium, etc. But a lot of them, especially the lanthanides, have not been understood, and very few provings have been done on them. There have been some recently, but not too much. But as these have been newer remedies that have come up for discussion and review of their clinical capacity, I put them into the Orem chapter as a means to give us another comparative device. I talk about another theme, syphilitic pain, bones, joints, head and heart. So all of the main syphilitic expression physically in Orem, and then I compare with many remedies that also could share some of those physical symptoms. Remember, some cases they will only express the symptoms on a physical level. You will not get much on the psychological level. It will all be expressed in that way. Therefore, you need to understand the expression of the physical pathology within every given remedy. Heart is another theme because it's one of the key aspects of the oral pathology and then also genitalia because also we see oral being one of the main remedies in orchitis and inflammation of different genitalia as well as the syphilitic aspects there. So that's, that's oral. Uh, I discuss bird remedies in the book. I do a whole theme on birds and that's in the phosphorus chapter. Why the phosphorus chapter? Because it seems based on our knowledge right now that many bird remedies relate to the tubercular myosin. The need to escape, but also they can't totally escape. They have to come down to earth to feed, to give birth. Uh, so there is a quest in the, in the bird remedies to be free, and some bird remedies are freer than others. And so they express a liberated aspect of the tubercular miasm, and some are more contained, and they don't feel so free. But the dynamic of the tubercular miasm is that I must be free. I have to escape. Tuberculosis became such a dominant disease in early in industrial society, as people moved from rural areas to industrial cities, the congestion leading to the bacteria being more prevalent. Why did the bacteria exist there? Because it was the fertile ground for it. So people were affected by the susceptibility to it, leading to the disease itself, but also leading just to the tubercular miasm as a phenomena, in a way as a cultural phenomena, and it expressed itself in romantic poetry, the pre-Raphaelite painters. This is all tubercular influence. The early explorers, the mountaineers, the people pioneers, this was all the tubercular impulse, which reflected a desire to escape a fixed, structured reality. And as we know in, uh, in England, the tubercular miasma is very alive, even more than America in a way. Even though America is the land of immigrants, in a way, in England, we were the land of people who wanted to get out and escape the narrow constraints of class-based society or the small island mentality. And a lot of the early mountaineers and pioneers were, were British, and, uh, and they were very much influenced by the tubercular miasm. So certain remedies, therefore, have to fit into that, and uh, the bird remedies do. Tuber tuberculinum is the, obviously the nose of the tubercular miasm, the sun. The 
surrounding that would be phosphorus, calcarea phosphorica, stanum, drosera, rumex, and other remedies that also fit within the tubercular miasm. So a large part of the book is also in exploring these ideas of, uh, of, of miasmatic influence, miasmatic themes, and miasmatic remedies that fit within the broader template. The halogen remedies, for example, you know, the bromium, the chlorine, the iodine, and the fluorine, these are also classified in the tubercular miasm, and you'll find them in the uh, tuberculinum chapter, because one of the key components of tuberculinum is all sorts of respiratory diseases, chronic coughs, et cetera, et cetera, pneumonia, uh, asthma from coughs, and one of the key areas of pathology of the halogens is the larynx, trachea, and chest, and they all have a theme of, of escape and needing to escape, and not wanting to be tied down, they need to be liberated, and they will go to extremes to do that. So there are certain similarities there within the tubercular miasm. Uh, what else should I say? Uh, the third index is a therapeutic index, like a mini repertory, where if you want to find some of the themes of the book, of any chapter, you can simply go to that uh, therapeutic therapeutic index and explore it. There's just one one called burning, and, the, and then it relates to the chapters in which burning is a major theme. So that index is not related to a page, but to a chapter, making you explore it from a more generalities point of view. So if you just want to see burning as a theme, there are certain chapters in which burning is seen as a significant aspect of the remedy. And when you look at that chapter, it will then lead you to another chapter. So and like the map of London, you'll go around and around and around. So I hope it will be a, a significant support and help for both students and practitioners. Uh, on, my, on the website, uh, Comparative Materia Medica, uh, I have uh, the opportunity for people to complete, to add to this information so that actually the work I've started can be continued uh, by other people saying, oh, actually, I found that this remedy was interesting in comparison to that remedy, and this remedy was interesting in comparison to that remedy. So I can use this data, this information, and build this up and actually then write a second edition, which would be adding other people's experience to this, uh, to, to this form. And as such, it will be a work in progress, because any one book by any one individual only reflects somewhat that person's knowledge and experience. And of course, it's much broader than that. But I'm hoping that the book will will be an interesting study point. Uh, one of the sort of main comparative material medicas was by a guy called a 19th century homeopath who wrote a book called Comparative Material Medica, and it was seen as one of the Bible material medicas of, of its time. And he was a sort of genius material medica uh, uh, researcher and, and practitioner. He died fairly young, but this book was his uh, in the tome. And when I revisited it, it's a book that has often been on my shelf, but I found much of the information to be not so relevant to what we are doing today in our, our homeopathy. And, and in, in my mind, it was always what led me to say, oh, we need a modern comparative materia medica. We need a way to kind of explore materia medica in an interesting way. And so by doing this book in this way, I'm, I was hoping that we've actually done that. And um, as I say, I try and include a lot of the new remedies, but fundamentally start from the basis of our existing knowledge base and, and our awareness of the need to understand the polycrest well and how to compare them in our practice. And to also know when it's not a polycrest, and this is one of the key aspects of our prescribing, that knowledge that comes with experience, that knows when it's not any known remedy, and that can only happen when you know those remedies well enough. When you know them, you then can intimate when the unknown is calling you, when you have to look outside the realms of your own existing knowledge. And that, as practitioners, is what we have to do all the time. We have to always challenge the boundaries of our own existing knowledge. We can never make an assumption that we're going to that we're going to know what that person needs until we've really explored it. Sometimes it hits us on the head and it's obvious, and other times it's not. And the key is only to know the difference. The key is really about awareness. It's like knowing thyself. It's only about the awareness of yourself and the knowledge that what you're experiencing is only one level of experience. Is the beginning of freedom from your own thoughts, from your own mind. If you believe you're your own mind then you're caught in whatever the mind does. And as we know, it's a disaster if you believe what's going through your mind all the time. Basically, it should be a point of skeptical investigation of the nature of your own mind 
as it is in our own knowledge of homeopathy. So we always have to, in a way, challenge the boundaries of our knowledge and go beyond that and, uh, and in the end, come back to what we know. Go out, come back, go out, come back. And so in a way, this book is a, a means, ideally, to do that. Just to summarize, and the remedies that I do include in the book, if you haven't looked at the, uh, at the, uh, the uh, website, is Aconite is the first chapter, Agaricus is the second, and I want to have make sure the remedies are covered there that really represent the diversity of our material America, because there's a lot of interesting fungi remedies, for example. And of course, I discussed that in the Agaricus chapter, and uh, again, I quote from Vermoulin's book on that, which is a fascinating area of research. And, one of the most interesting things in sort of the modern world biologically is the growth of funguses. Funguses is disease, and I think in a way they have been predicated through the abuse of uh, antibiotics that have led to fungal infections. And you see a lot of AIDS conditions where all of the complications are fungal. You know, so and the suppression through antibiotics can lead to the prevalence of, of fungus diseases. And it may be that in our homeopathy we need to know how to use those funguses in a in, in a different way. So agaricus is discussed in detail, and it's also a, a drug remedy, so I discussed other so-called drug remedies within that. Apis is obviously a great way to go into all the insect remedies, uh, and the work that's been done by many homeopaths, including Sankran and other people, and uh, into the idea of insects, and how you understand when an insect is needed as a, gener as a sort of general remedy, and then which insect do you need to use. Apis has been the default one, but, but it's been abused. I mean, many other insect remedies may be just as big, but we've tended to under only understand Apis, as we have done with lacuses for snakes, and that's a whole area of investigation. It's a whole world out there. There's more varieties of insects than any other species, and they're one of the most adaptive species on the planet. Understanding their homeopathicity as a remedy is a key part of our study, and when I wrote the book, I have to say, I kind of realized that in my experience, I probably gave way too many snakes and even spiders when, in fact, an insect remedy was needed. And so I think in our knowledge as practitioners, a study of insect remedies is very important. And I recommend Peter Fraser's book on that, Transformation from the Brown's Insects, as a great study of that. Argentum nitricum is the next chapter. Arnica is the next one. And in Arnica, I go into all the Asteraceae remedies, which is one of the great botanical families and consistent with a lot of symptoms similar to arnica, trauma, wounds, hemorrhaging, bruising, soreness, aching. I compare that with the rust toxins of the world and the Rutaceae family and uh, the Fabiaceae family so that there's a big comparison there between those botanical families. Uh, Seneca Marlboro might mention Aura Metallicum, Dorita Carbonica, Calcarea Carbonica, Carcinosis in Corsicum, Ferro Metallicum, Crophytes, Ignatia, Calcarea Carb, Black Caninum, and I go into all the milk remedies and the comparison between the milks and the sugar remedies and uh, a major area of modern homeopathic research in terms of looking at new milks that are needed, uh, Black Caninum being the default one, but of course we have all the other milks nowadays. Lachesis, the default snake remedy, but it's such a fascinating area of study for homeopaths. Uh, Lycopodium, Medorina, Mercurius, Salubilis, Nitrum, Muriaticum, Vomica, Opium, Phosphorus, Plotina, Sorinum, Pulsatilla, Sepia, Silica, Staphys agris, Dramonium, Sulfur, Tarantula, Hispanica, Pia, Tuberculinum, and then finally Zingiba. And uh, that is the chapter headings, and as I say, I deconstruct each chapter according to the themes and the remedies that are compared within each theme. So that's the book. That's the book. It's uh, available from booksellers. It's available from uh, my website, comparativematerialmedica.com. And um, I'm very uh, sent. You can also email me if you have any questions at richardwpitt at gmail.com. Uh, all my details are there on the site. If you have any questions, then please uh, go ahead and uh, I can end of the meeting if you have any questions uh, please go ahead where can I find Richard's book comparative material medica dot com would be one way uh, whole health now also have the books right now uh, homeopathic educational services in the East Bay will have the books um, if you're in England, uh, John Morgan at Helios Pharmacy has the books. 
Uh, if you're outside of uh, England, um, they're basically the best way is through my website. Where can I find Richard? Where is that's a good question? I wish I knew. I am basically right now in Kenya. Uh, I'm in the East Bay right now uh, and in California. I've just come back to the States for a little bit of time and to wrap things up. Uh, in my nomadic tubercular lifestyle, I put my stuff in storage seven years ago and, and I finally decided to do the final purge of all my belongings. Uh, and um, so that was one reason why I had to come back was to do that. So uh, I lived in California 20 years and uh, yeah, so anyway, right now I am, I'm a permanent nomad. And I think it's probably likely to stay that way, especially as uh, given the uh, the nature of the work in Kenya. Yeah, and the website address that was one question, and uh, that is uh, comparativematerialmedica.com. Okay. All right. Hi, Jamie. My first live webinar. I've been watching the free one since I found your site. Okay. Oh yeah, Nariana doesn't have my book right now. Uh, I basically uh, sent it to them, and uh, it's not listed yet. They, they are reviewing it. I have to get the book to Nariana, uh, but the book is published uh, you know, through Create Space, which is an Amazon print-on-demand. So as people order the books, they're sent out. So right now, I'm doing most of the distribution myself. Uh, if you're in Europe, uh, the best way either, it's, it's still the same to be honest, you can just go to my website, it's the best way to go right now. When Nariana has it, great, uh, we just haven't got to that point yet. Oh, here's a long message, I don't know what, okay, hang on a sec. I've just ordered and paid for my book from my website with PayPal, the advertised price was including postage. I really hope this is the case that I live in Australia. <laughs> I'm concerned now that this didn't include Australia. It does include Australia. It's sent to you. It's on its way. I, I, I've, I, I sent two to Australia, so you should be good. But And I get everything. If you do through PayPal, it comes to me, and I, I send it out pretty pretty sharpish. So uh, And it does include it. I had a deal, which is still up there. It's not meant to be up there. It was in the end of August where you could get the book actually at a cheaper price. It's $60, to be honest. Uh, retail, but I was offering it for $52, including postage in the United States. Australia was $58, so I meant to change it. I just haven't got around to it, actually. <laughs> Hi, bets. I haven't got around to changing it right now. So if you go there now, I will honor that same price, uh, no problem. But uh, you have to do it soon. Yeah, Hi, bets. Good to see you here. And advice on becoming a good homeopath. Yes, go to a good school. Go to a good school, read good books. You can study on your own, but go to a good school. Yeah, go to Barbara's school. She does an online school right now, and uh, you know, and and study with as many people as you can. Just get out there. The more people you study with, the better. And there are no handouts. The handout you can go online to my website, and there are tons of essays about the book extractions from the. You can read everything on, on that uh, on the book based on on the website. It's the best way to go. I think that's it, so I think we're pretty good. Let's have a look. Good, hey, well thank you everybody. Uh, this has been a pleasure. Uh, I've talked for an hour and a quarter. I think we're pretty good here and I think I've given a, hopefully a good overview of the book. Check out my other book as well, uh, The Natural Medicine Guide for Travel and Home. I'm just, as I said, writing a new version of that which is going to be a condensed form of the same book. Uh, stay in touch with me if you need to know more about that work. The project in Africa, if you have any desire to give financially, I, there is a way in which you get tax deductible deductions from America. Uh, I worked on that before and I'm still working on it. You have to contact me individually and I have to set it up for you, but there are ways of doing it. We have this unique project there. Uh, we have five years to prove to the EU and the world that homeopathy can be integrated successfully into the healthcare system uh, in a country in Africa and we need to show that and verify it and that. And so we have a very big project. If we can do it in Kenya, it can spread to Africa. And as we know, homeopathy is affordable, accessible, and it is working. And that's what Africa needs. It's what the world needs. And we need to, we need to do that. So we have this opportunity. And so as I say, I'll be based uh, going back there now and working on that project. And uh, that's 
that's where I'll be from some of the time. So thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time, and it's been nice to talk to you. Good night.